Welcome to the first session of the Broadcast Sport Tech Innovation Forum 2020. What a year it's been. In this session, the broadcaster panel, we talked to Jamie Hindhoff, COO of BT Sport, and Philip Burney, BBC Sport Head of TV, to discuss the many challenges of 2020 and how they adapted to provide new ways of working during COVID-19, including the tech that has enabled smarter working during lockdown. So to kick off with, I guess it makes sense to look back at March 2020 and lockdown hit. Live sports were cancelled, you know, big events such as the Olympics and Euro started to be cancelled and, you know, there's big sort of schedule filling sports events. Um, you know, scary times at the time. Uh, maybe, Jamie, you could start us off with. How did you kind of react? What was your immediate reaction to all that? I can't remember my immediate reaction, but it's very surreal now, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, look at the facts, Jake. Uh, 16th of March, I think it was. Uh, we're a subscription sports TV network, a live sports TV network. So you take away the live sport element. That's a real challenge for us. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think hindsight is a wonderful thing where we can now see how it played out. But at that time, there was no indication of what or when or how. Um, so, I mean, the biggest thing for us was as a subscription network is making sure that we could create content or still create content that was relevant to our audiences. So obviously no live sport, but there's a huge wealth of archive. Uh, we've got a great array of on-screen talent. And uh, I think the thing I was most proud of actually is within 10 days of lockdown, we were broadcasting live using um, a, a decentralized gallery that was, if you remember, we talked about it quite a lot of the time, mm. sort of deconstructed and reconstructed around people's houses in the UK, joined together by 4G and by Wi-Fi, enabling us to do debate, topical talk shows, archive shows. I mean, the MotoGP one was a great one where we still got audience uh, engagement as well. So, yeah, it was um, a real creative time about creating content to do with sport, trying to keep some of that live element Mm. So, so doing pre-recorded shows for me wasn't the answer. We needed to be live, uh, but trying to find um, exciting content for a short period, at least, to fulfil our audience's requirements. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about that decentralised approach um, yeah. shortly because it was really impressive. Um, and Philip, same question to you. You know, what what was your you know immediate response to that? Well, like everyone's really, uh, uh, it, was, it, was, it was really difficult. Um, just the actual initial lockdown and the consequences of that for everyone's life made it uh, very difficult and a very swift adjustment for everyone involved in the teams, um, personally. And then obviously professionally, uh, as far as the BBC was concerned, we had a glorious summer of major events lined up, including mm -hmm. the Euros and the Olympics, which went, uh, Wimbledon too. Um, and that uh, needed a lot of immediate work, uh, obviously dealing with the rights holders in the first place in terms of what their plans were, dealing with a lot of people that were due to be working on those and what our thoughts were with them in terms of the events and the postponement or in Wimbledon's case, cancellation. Mm. And then kind of what Jamie's saying, uh, immediately uh, uh, with, our, with our channels that we've got, working through what we could do to try and provide some material to fill some of the airtime. No one's pretending that... Um, showing archive or, or reversion to archive is anything like showing a live event it isn't but uh, where we had those huge gaps where we had great sways of big events we thought it was very important to give people a really strong flavor of those big events which we did and huge credit to the teams uh, who in very short order again echoing what Jamie said turned around you know a massive a massive program we did about nearly 300 hours at, um, programming of, of various hues uh, through through the ensuing months uh, which meant we did show um, examples of great action from the Euros the Olympics and, and Wimbledon so that was that was uh, the, the really sort of key immediate reaction and then I'm sure we'll come on to it it was it was dealing with the resumption of sport and how we were going to deliver sport live sport when it came back uh, with the new restrictions that, um, that the pandemic uh, um, entailed. Yes, as you say, we'll talk about that in a moment. And how, how did the audience react to those kind of archive driven shows? I mean, presumably they were quite forgiving because, you know, everyone was living through the lockdown and, and realised what, you know, you needed to do. 
Yes. Yeah, they went down very well, actually. I mean, again, the numbers, you're not going to get the numbers you get for live sport doing that mm. kind of program. You know that. But they went down very well. And they were all, there's a lot of creativity showing that there as well. The, um, the match today, uh, top 10 podcast, that was a really important thing for us to keep something going in that sort of regular football Saturday evening slots that mm. match the day um, takes up. And it's sort of part of the absolute kind of weekend um, um, habit for so many people. So really mm. important we kept that going. Um, and and then some really creative uh, elements around some of the Euro stuff, as I mentioned, certainly Wimbledon had the whole fortnight presented from Wimbledon, actually, which, That's is, right, yeah. which was quite uh, quite challenging, but it's actually good to actually be on site for that. Wimbledon were terrific and incredibly helpful. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, as always, Wimbledon really put them put themselves out to make sure that we could deliver that again all done remotely obviously in terms of production mm. and the Olympics did a sort of special kind of celebratory um uh, the greatest British moments ever and those did pretty well and some of these did you know they did they did perfectly respectable audiences again mm. not live mm. but perfectly respectable audiences and there was definitely a real we knew they were very welcome there was a there was obviously proven there was no live sport going on at all so to actually have um to actually have uh some degree of sport happening was was a was a real bonus and people were very uh I think people were appreciative of it mm. and and Jamie the decentralized uh, way of working um mm. that you brought in like you say, very quickly after lockdown came into effect. Um, what exactly was that and what did it enable you to do? Well, it was, it was recognising that, you know, we, we have average about three, 400 people on site at Stratford every day. We went down to one shift overnight because mm. we have to keep our people safe. And uh, we just looked at our control panels and mechanisms to be able to drive the brilliant infrastructure we've got, but do it from people's homes so they're not having to travel. Um, so we literally, um, we did the MotoGP show, we did the Saturday morning uh, early kickoff show, we brought back um, a show called The Football's Not On <laughs> uh, with Ian Stone, okay. and, and it was mm-hmm. it was about being topical um, and using archive, but, you know, either re-commentary, add a new commentary to it, or giving different analysis, um, and, and like Philip, you know, the, I, I do think the audiences were very forgiving, and I think if nothing else, it showcased how important live sport is to our to our audiences, to the public in the UK. Mm-hmm. And you know, my my favourite moment was um, having the reminder of when I was working with Philip, actually watching the 2012 opening ceremony again. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, it was um, it took me right back. And uh, there's some great content out there that that people were having the chance to see again. Yeah. I mean, the other thing that people were doing or broadcasters were doing was looking at esports a little bit and bringing that in to replace live sports and obviously the sports documentaries as well. Um, Jamie, we've spoken before about esports and a, as a mm. subscription um, service, whether you feel you could add more to esports than what's already available for free to the audience. And you were slightly skeptical. What's your sort of current thinking on that? I think um, I think the sooner you drop the term esport and talk about sport, the more opportunity there is. I think I think you're categorising something and giving perceptions. So we've we've just done a deal for the V10 series for two years, right? Um, and I would defy, apart from when they crash and then carry on again, that you would know that was the live sport. Mm-hmm. Uh, we did we did a program in the summer, the Beat Sport uh, Challenge, FIFA Challenge, uh, with G Infinity, which was brilliant. But we used that we used the esports platform as an opportunity to bring our talent in the banter and to create competition. I mean, I think the one thing we were all missing when there was no live sport was just that competitive element. Mm. Um, and so it did that. I mean, long term, I think esports is really interesting. Um, whether it works behind a paywall, I'm not so sure. Uh, but I think there is a happy way through where we can you work with that content because it is still sport. It's just a different, different platform. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly a lot of new tournaments created during lockdown, wasn't there? Um, most of the sports were bringing out some sort of esports equivalent. Um, Philip, what, what's the sort of BBC's position on esports? There's, you know, not much on there, is there? Is it something that you'd look to or have been discussing? We, we've done a bit. Uh, we've had a couple of um, uh, areas where we've, we've done some stuff online and, and um, BBC Three have ventured into it. So right. we're certainly, we certainly um, uh, will keep exploring it. And um, that there, there are, uh, um, there, you know, that there, there are opportunities there, which we can see it, it's, it's worked very well on other platforms to be fair, you know, obviously Twitch mm. is a phenomenal mm. success. So there's, there's definitely um, other areas where it's, it, there's greater volume than the BBC has done, but we're certainly not averse to seeing, 
what we can do with it. And we know it's obviously got, you know, phenomenal um, interest levels and uh, and support and following. So, yeah, we're, we're certainly keen to explore what more we can do with it. OK, so after the first bit of lockdown, then things did start to ease off a little bit. Obviously, life sports started coming back again. Um, Premier League came back. Uh, we, how, how long did it take to sort of, you know, reestablish things as to some degree, what they might have been before the pandemic hit? Or is that a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, things haven't quite happened like that? <laughs> as well, yet. I, I, would, I would point out, Jake, you missed out the Bundesliga completely. Oh, good point, yeah. A, a month before the Premier League. Yeah, yeah. Uh, live on BT Sport. Um, I, I think, you know, I talked about this before. So we, we always had a strategy to go remote production. And I think this current pandemic where you, you need social distancing, remote production is, is the perfect scenario. Uh, and we also had our learnings from when we went into initial lockdown. So when, when uh, the Bundesliga came back, which was in May from memory, um, we were doing live coverage with commentators from home, vision mixers from home, directors from home, et cetera. And then, then we started bringing back studio wraps because we consciously didn't do studios because um, we wanted empathy with our audience. We didn't feel it was right. And again, we were driving the studio control rooms from people's homes. Um, and so we'd, we'd already been doing remote production on the National League and WSL, either over 4G or satellite. Um, and the Premier League actually was on my four year roadmap uh, because it was deemed so difficult to be able to do that. We, we were leaving it almost till last mm. to do. Um, and then within five weeks, working with Telegenic, building the remote operating centre, reconverting some of Stratford, we delivered our four year plan in five weeks. and. You know, when the Premier League came back, totally remote pres and match coverage still is uh, and will be moving forward. I mean, it was a it, there's not many good things come out of COVID, but the opportunity to really drive through that that workflow change at a time where it was justified, not just from a creative aspect, but also from a, a health and safety aspect was critical. And I'm really proud of what, what we've delivered, actually. So your coverage of the Premier League has gone entirely remote is it now mm -hmm. i mean you, how many vehicles do you send to a typical game now uh we still send one right uh but we we have very few people in it so we drive yeah. the kit in there from uh, either high wickham or strap and previously how many would you send uh we would have had two stroke three uh and i think staffing was about fourfold higher. right well wow. so it's very different yeah mm. yeah and, and also yeah. just to throw in from a green credentials our carbon footprint as half mm. doing uh, Premier League coverage so there's lots of good things presumably out. there'll be no reason to go back to what it was like before for things like the Premier League if you're you know the quality is the same from the yeah no I think I mean we, we're still doing it remote production we're still doing it 4k HDR which I think mm. is a huge achievement um, which was a challenge for a lot of people while the trucks were on site and I think for me it's a, it's a pick and mix Jake and you, you know our strategy was all about sustainability work-life balance um, and enhancing creative opportunity, which remote does all of those. Hmm. So, so you will always look at that best fit, trying to hit your strategic targets. But no, it works really well. Hmm. And what about you, Philip, for live sports when it started to, you know, be something you could actually do again? How did it impact on the way you approach the production? Similarly, in terms of remote production, absolutely. That was that. That's. The, I mean, I have to say, like Jamie, the, the acceleration that we all knew that was the direction we were heading in for for very good sustainability reasons. But that was the that that it, it hugely ramped up that that process without a doubt, and and I think for for general benefit. So, you know, we have our own setup in our in our in our Salford base. Uh, to remotely produce OBs. We're doing a, a, a great deal of remote OBs now. We obviously produce matches for the Premier League as well as for the FA Cup, for example, in football, but in other sports too. Um, in other sports too, the vast majority of what we produced has been, certainly in terms of presentation, uh, produced from uh, remotely and, and, and the great majority or, or the majority of OBs as well um, produced remotely as well. We used other facilities initially. Now, as I said, we have our own our own set up there so it, it's mm. it's it's dramatically changed that i mean the answer the question of whether that will carry on in the future yes i think to a large degree i mean it will depend on a case-by-case -case basis there are some some areas and some events um that there's still benefits um to, to being on site but um this has definitely opened up a whole new area which it's been proven to work um mm. uh so i think it's been a really interesting development and are you like BT Sport in that, say, the director and the producer and the vision mixer 
can all work from there essentially from home and kind of connect together or have you not sort of established a sort of decentralized workflow we haven't done that in quite that way no so we we, we we've um pretty much carried on using our salford base to uh to to operate from yeah albeit remotely in, in most cases yeah mm. yeah gotcha. um and then i don't know if there's much more to say on the sort of lockdown side of things <laughs> um, but if we move on to sort of broader issues around uh, being a sports broadcaster at the moment, there's, you know, continues to be, even in 2020, this kind of move towards OTT and direct consumer platforms. There's lots of sort of specific sports ones, and there's also sort of broad sports um, services such as DAZN, which are now starting to go global, and Eleven, which are uh, making ambitions to go global as well. And, you know, numerous other players. There's also, you know, Amazon Prime videos coming into, uh, you know, the marketplace with the Premier League uh, coverage and lots of tennis. Um, what, you know, how, how do kind of traditional linear sports broadcasters, you know, what, what sort of impact is it likely to have on you having these kind of new players coming in? Is it sort of big time competition? I mean, can you all sort of sit together in one happy sort of sports broadcast family? Um, oh yes we're all we're all we're all we're all just one big happy collaborative aren't we just work together all the time no. well no i mean yes and no uh on the one hand you know jim and i know each other for old and, and people you know people get on pretty well on the other hand it's a very competitive business uh uh sports is a very competitive business so um uh whoever you're dealing with in the end there are some prime sports rights and um you know depending on what your own strategy is and what your financial position is uh, we want to get hold of we want to get hold of those in varying degrees so of course it's 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 competitive how that how that landscape changes with new entrants is um you know again very variable i mean there's all kinds of options um i can only speak for the bbc uh, a very different kind of animal obviously to to anybody because of um the way we're funded um and not being commercial so um you know and also the you know by, by necessity therefore we want to be we do want to be collaborative as much as we, we, we can with people we're competitive um and and we are very happy to partner with anybody really if if, if it certainly suits our interest you know in the end we need to defend the interests of uh, the license fee payers and indeed you know our audiences but um we, you know w with w within those parameters we're always open to looking at, at wider partnerships so you know that depends on others wanting to partner with us or anybody wanting to partner at all or whether they want exclusivity which is perfectly legitimate and where a lot of, where a lot of sports uh, rights end up so it's a very it's a very you're right it's a very interesting changing field i think the pandemic and um the financial consequence of it has definitely affected the sports rights market generally quite unpredictable actually at the moment i think in terms of where that will end up obviously sports themselves have been terribly badly affected by uh, in terms of in terms of um funding issues so you know th this is a difficult time um for everybody and, and quite what emerged from it people don't know but all i can say from our our angle is that we're of course we're open to to work with others um you know if the opportunity is right and it works in in our interests as well as theirs you put quite a lot of stuff out on the bbc sport website as well don't you sort of like more niche sports and you've got that sort of varied mix that um, is quite different to your linear tv experience as well is that something you're sort of building up more and more each year well, yes. I mean, our streaming services we developed uh, quite a lot over the last few years. Again, we're having to make uh, calls there on on what we're streaming. I mean, you know, it's not an endless uh, it, it's an endless pipeline, but we just need to make sure that we're we're focusing on um, what we think will work best. But that's quite that does open up many more opportunities certainly than through you know a couple of linear channels. Mm. So yes, we've been very keen to explore what we can do. Um, with sports and we performed some very good relationships and, and actually got some very decent numbers with uh, with some of the streaming. I mean, that, that, that's um, both with new sports and with the lower levels of some sports, like the sort of uh, the early rounds of things like the FA Cup and the Rugby League Challenge mm. Cup, for example, mm. have worked really well uh, in, in, in when we streamed them. But again, yes, that's definitely an area where we started streaming more widely um, sports that are keen to have our, use our platform. And Jamie, um, I don't know if you remember the question. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, what, what's BT Sports take on, you know, all this sort of more competition or potentially more competition? Uh, I, th I think there's a few things, Jake. I think, firstly, competition's already been, always been there. I mean, eight years ago, we didn't exist. Um, so you look at the impact there. So I think it's always it's been there. I think I, I get slightly 
disturbed about this conversation of the new OTT world because for me it's just a different pipe. So the content we're putting out over linear, we also, you know, we have our big screen apps. Mm. Um, so we are OTT, if that's what you want to call it, but which is a broadcaster and you deliver content as you can across various mm. different mediums. And I think where it will lead longer term is that um, one-to-one relationship, which I think is is exciting. But uh, Philip hit it on the head. I mean, we all, we all partner. We're a very small industry, actually. And, you know, I produce content with some certain volume for Amazon. Mm. We work very closely with the BBC on the Premier League and some of the other products. Um, we work with ITV on other uh, other events as well. But I think it's, it's a really schizophrenic world, isn't it? Because we also work very closely with Sky on, on some elements. But when it comes down to rights and that exclusivity bit, that, that's mm. the bit where it's um, it, it's really challenging because there are commercial impacts that side. So I... I, I I, th- I think we're all competitors, but we're all friends um, yeah. to a certain point. But like I said, I think the start, I think the important thing is is to accept that competition is forever changing and will forever change, and that's what we should all expect. Hmm. Um, this is obviously a, a tech innovation forum, so it would be remiss of me not to ask you about. It's been a difficult year, obviously, and it's very lockdown focused. But what would you say? is your sort of biggest innovation you've introduced over the last 12 months and kind of i suppose why did you opt to focus on that particular innovation as well bt sport are obviously well known for your higher yeah. resolutions and different ways of getting content out there so i don't know if you know you think even pre-lockdown there's quite a lot of stuff going on which is easy to yeah. forget about nowadays i mean last 12 months 8k we did the first live broadcast of 8k which fits in with our bt sport ultimate Thing, which is capturing the best format and deliver to to the screen and platform taking what connectivity you've got the best quality picture um big innovation we've launched in the last year is enhanced audio actually mm-hmm. um supporting and showing you the power of sound to help tell a story visually um i think it was there uh also of course um we launched our match day experience as well which is rolling out ar watch together and a whole portfolio of products that are uh, on the mobile screen that enhance that experience and allow people to watch a game live together. Uh, and I'm really proud of that. that. That was all conceived and delivered during lockdown mm. um, and launched uh, last week. And then, of course, let's not underestimate the stuff that none of our audiences see, but stuff that Philip's team have been doing, my team have been doing around remote production and this ability to produce content in such a different way with such a short period of time without impacting the quality what we mm. do so uh, and there's also the fan engagement as well you know bringing in the, the fans into our coverage as well with our fan wall uh, other broadcasters done similar so i think it's been a really um it's been a really great time for innovation and, and in that uh these sorts of challenges really drive creativity i think and, and helping us address problems that we can see are impacting people with the circumstances we're having to live with them and going back to the audio thing what was that I, i'm not sure if i remember that bit uh, well, it's, it's the crowd crowd effects. Uh, oh, I mean, yes, we, introduced yeah, course, it, yeah. we introduced it for the Bundesliga. Um, and interestingly, we we offered it without choice. Um, and when we were coming towards the Premier League, having looked at that experience initially, we were going to go with without enhanced sound and then press red to get enhanced sound. And we flipped it mm. because I think a lot of people were wary of it. But for me, it just reinforces noise sound so mm. so important for for how you watch live sport mm. um philip same question to you what do you think uh, has been sort of one of the sort of biggest innovations for the bbc for sports coverage well a similar answer so you might <laughs> you might query who's innovating here because everyone's doing, doing the same sort of thing but look, i think every, every everybody everybody got the same message which was we had to we had to alter quite dramatically the way we produce things so uh um well you know we had done other things already actually at the start of the season we did a really big change to our studio presentation in terms of vr Gosh, and actually yeah. already plotted that for some of our big events coming up in 2020 which never happened hmm. so i think that was a really big significant change for how our, our football looked actually um hmm. 
that, that that's changed quite dramatically and the huge amounts of work to learn that i think it's been very effective mm. um but uh, uh beyond that then yes with with, with the pandemic there were all kinds of ways of how you could work differently, which have, which have succeeded. So uh, that includes remote editing and how people can remote. I mean, you said we, we talked about not um, um, remote direction quite in the same way as BT, but certainly in terms of remote editing, there was a lot going on the BBC with that. And again, that had been sort of tentatively explored, much more fully explored. And certainly the remote production um, and indeed delivery through cloud-based vehicles or cloud-based deliveries as well, you know, m making use of all kinds of ways that um, did not involve people all uh, traipsing down to one place to produce has been, I think, the biggest, most significant change in the way that we've we produced and um, and great great credit to the teams and I know obviously the same applies to BT and others mm -hmm. for how they've adapted to that because it's difficult I mean you know we shouldn't um, skirt around the fact that uh, okay you're still in a truck outside the ground so you're not next to people but um, you have been separated from quite a lot of talent and some others that are working on it it's not the absolute ideal of how you'd work, want to work person to person but it has really worked um, and the technical setup and the um, production management setup uh, in organising all that, and then indeed the delivery by the by the production themselves, I think has been um, has been outstanding, and, uh, and and that's definitely been I think the biggest the biggest shift that we've seen this year. It used to be um, with uh, remote production uh, as live, the communications between the say the director and producer who are remotely not at, well, basically not at the stadium and the camera operator and stuff. There used to be a couple of seconds delay and you used to have to just kind of accommodate that. Presumably that with all these changes and this kind of proper rollout of remote production, those kind of issues aren't there anymore, I'm guessing. Yeah, they've been, they've been wrangled. You, you work through them. And mm. um, yeah, uh, I mean, I think the testimony, Jake, is in the quality of the output. Mm. Uh, and you certainly wouldn't be able to pick which one was remote and which one wasn't mm. and um, people need to do their jobs they need to talk to each other I think the other thing as well as I, I agree with what Philip said is that we're all claiming we're innovating around this and we've all done a similar thing but that was really really important because in, as an industry we all employ a lot of freelancers who work for all of us mm. um, and, and so it, when you're innovating you, you do have to um, look at what other people are doing work together almost because you need some sort of consistent way of working otherwise you start creating huge problems for yourself and for the industry mm -hmm. so i don't think it's any surprise that we've all ended up in a very similar place because this is a pre-record we've not got questions from the audience so uh, is there anything else you either of you wanted to add or talk about that you think we haven't covered as yet as regards anything to do with broadcast tech technology and sport or the industry generally i just kind of reiterate what i was just saying about the uh uh, and I'm sure this applies to BT, I'm sure it applies across the industry. The, it, this has been a massive testament to the British sports uh, broadcasting industry of how well they've dealt with a really challenging situation. You know, we talked it all through glibly, Jamie and I, one step removed from those who are actually doing the, th doing the stuff. Mm. <laughs> and, and, you know, I absolutely take my hat off to those that are doing the stuff because, you know, uh, it's been really uh, i repeat it's been really challenging in times you know to get all the setups i mean to make to make these safe environments mm. you know to make sure that people are protected and, and how all that works and therefore even when you are stuck in galleries you know you're you're, you're, you're removing people you've got barriers between everybody all over the place um and as you mentioned then there's kind of talk back issues to be worked through as well that's just the first stage of actually starting to communicate to somebody let alone delivering it all um and through it all it's just worked and i've just seen loads of other broadcasts as well on BT and elsewhere and it's just been incredibly impressive as Jamie says you'd really struggle to see the difference between that and what happened before and, and it just shows we have an incredible workforce of talented people at all levels as I say production technical production management uh, organizational logistics um, and we should all be really proud of them because you know this has been an incredibly incredibly difficult testing year for everybody and um, and to come through it so well and to deliver support one of the few things that is now still going on one of the few ways people can still enjoy themselves uh, is is has been has been really heartwarming and what's um you know in, in, in those in those chilly times mm, fantastic so yeah 
Oh, Jamie, how about you? Yeah, no, no, I echo everything Philip just said, and um, I'm not sure one step removed, but I, I, I take the sentiment. <laughs> 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 um, uh, the one, the one I'm a few more steps is... than you removed, don't worry. You're not close to I know, Jamie. The one thing I would say as well, Jake, apart from uh, there is a challenge for us all in the, the way the seasons have collided together uh, and the compression, and, and it is pretty relentless, mm. actually. So the volume of work, everyone's having to do um which will go on now to the end of the season so we've sort of smacked one season into another which is tough but what i what i think we are going to see is is a lot more innovation coming out not formats not platforms particularly but how we engage and talk to our audiences i think we're seeing it's been a really great learning period about understanding what audiences want um, especially at times when they can't be at events. And I think we'll see quite a lot of nuances coming out from that that should be really exciting. You think things like CG fans in the stadium and stuff like that, no one's done that yet here, have they? No, and, um, I, you know, speaking personally, we looked at that, and for me, it's not authentic. Um, I think it takes it away from, you know, so even with Enhanced Sound, we've never tried to pretend there are fans in the stadium. No, yeah. uh, and I think I think you've got to keep a level of authenticity because uh, it's about people running around on the pitch. And I think that distraction and the complexities of delivering that remote and the complexities of so many cameras um, mm. would make all of that. Mm. It, doesn't, it doesn't work for me. It's not, it's not somewhere Beat Sport would, would want to go. Mm. You agree there, Philip? Obviously. I do agree, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, lovely stuff. Well, thanks very much, guys. Um, uh, really interesting debate as always or discussion and uh, love to speak to you both uh, good luck over the next months and next year and you know hopefully not too much longer with lockdown stuff but you know to battle through i'm sure um thanks a lot and uh, take care likewise thanks, a pleasure thanks jake good to speak to you later bye-bye